One thing I love is talking to other dreamers and other healers and people who really understand the mission of why we love dream work so much. Today I talked to my friend Jamie Foster who is a dream ambassador and really understands the power of a community when it comes to understanding your dreams. Yeah, I love your podcast. You're a breath of fresh air and I'm I'm just really glad you're doing that work out there in the world. Yeah, you too. Thanks. It's great to like just keep talking to people who understand like the power of dream work and just spread the word. I figured out that because of doing this interview with you, I figured out that I have been doing this for 22 years. Wow. So, okay. So let me tell you a little bit about what I do and how I got into this. What for everybody has a different gateway. You know, I I think some people are just born with the ability to be strong dreamers. I also was a really strong dreamer and I came from a family background where that was not, that was not a good thing. You know, I was constantly being told that that's, you know, that I should not talk about it, that I should repress it. So I think a lot of people in my generation and probably definitely your generation too, are where, you know, we're system breakers. That's what we came in here to do. And so the more I was told not to do it, the more I wanted to do it, you know, <laughs> like most things. And then I had, I had a series of events happen to me when I was 17. My best friend died in a car accident. And then six months later, my mom died of a heart attack. And the combo just totally derailed my whole life. You know, I was pretty young. Like I said, I was 17, but then I started having these really powerful dreams where they were Carrie, my best friend and my mom were coming and like spending all night hanging out with me and they would leave, you know, the dream would be over and I could, I could smell my mom, you know, which, uh, which I learned later is a smell olfactory sense is one of the, the, um, significators of um, visitations from the departed. But that made me start, I had to have answers. Like not only were they hanging out with me, but my mom was giving me really important information that I needed that was being withheld from me that I, you know, really needed to like, no, beyond the like dream of the departed. I listened to one of your pod- podcasts where you were talking about communal dreaming spaces, like how is this a thing, right? Well, at this point, I have worked with like hundreds and hundreds of different dreamers. And a handful of times I've had people um, tell me that they have had the exact same big dream experience that I had with my mom, which is just, I just find it so cool. So in this one particular dream I had with her, that was sort of like the start for me of, of really having to understand deeper. I climbed up inside of a mausoleum. That's what I called it. And it was just like a round glass structure that had my mom and me and another dreamer or another guide or someone. And she gave me information, you know, that I needed really, it had a lot to do with money and things that at 17 were out of my control. And then so after, so I would tell that dream a lot as I would start talking about, you know, the work that I do. And I've had a handful of people tell me, well, I had this dream where I met my aunt in a mausoleum. It was a glass mausoleum. And she told me about something my uncle did that I needed to know, you know, just like, so I still don't have an answer for it, but I wanted to bring it up because I loved your podcast you did about it. And like, that's a real place and how it works. Like, you know, if you're departed if you have to like you know sign up somewhere like I want this space at this time with this dreamer I don't know but I do know that you can go back there and so this is the work that that I've been trained to do is to help people re-enter their dreams individually and then also collectively as a group like you and I could both re-enter that dream that I just told you and get more information you can change things around you can ask other dream characters more information, you know, and try to turn the lights on and off, try to change things. And it's so powerful. It's so powerful. That's awesome. I love that you found like healing and clarity through the pain of losing somebody. Like, I think a lot of people start lucid dreaming that way. Like, hey, you're not supposed to be in my dream. Maybe this is a dream. And then they kind of start to use that space for something like really healing. And your story gave me goosebumps, by the way. Mm -hmm. So it's really a beautiful thing. And thank you for sharing that. A lot of people maybe don't realize going back to old dreams and helping each other, like break that down can like bring so much healing. It is spiritual empowerment. And people will often say, you know, I'll often get people who are like, I don't dream. And, you know, we, we meant this is how we started talking. Everybody dreams, you know, and, and not just everybody, everybody who's embodied. It's part, it's part of the deal. 
I try to keep it strictly to the dreaming because of that. You know, I've had a lot of different, very enlightening spiritual experience, but I try to keep the dreaming, just the dreaming because everybody can access it no matter what you're called to, you know, in the path. Right. And probably my biggest tool, spiritual tool for me has been my dream journal. If there was one thing I could give to people is like, you've got to write them down. What I find is that I precognitive, I am a precognitive dreamer and I do that a lot. And I don't think that's something unique to me. I think all humans, you know, in fact, some cultures like the Maori, for instance, um, in Australia, they believe that nothing happens until it is dreamed. Having a strong dream sharing practice is really healthy. Not only does it help you process your shadow, you know, and your fears, but all the time we're getting these precognitive bits. My personal belief in that also through dream work, I've discovered is that time is totally an illusion. You can go forwards or backwards anywhere within the dream realm. And so I think when we have a precognitive dream and we're getting little bits of it, it's like a pre run through in a way, but it's also like different timelines aligning. Right. And I, if I didn't write my dreams down, I wouldn't know. Like right now we live in Olympia, Washington, and we moved here about four years ago from Texas And what I found was that about two years before we moved, I started having dreams about Seattle. And I'd never even been to Seattle. There was no thread that we were going to move here at that point. But I found them in my dream journal. I was like, whoa, I totally dreamed about this before it happened. And again, it's like if I hadn't written them down, you know, I might not know later. When I was 17 and I had all those things happen, um, it was a few years after that that I met Robert Moss. And I don't know if you're familiar with his work, um, but he's just he's just one of the most amazing storytellers I've ever met. And his stories are true because they're all they're all like either he lived it or he's pulling it from the dream. And the biggest gift that I got from working with Robert over the years has been the structure. You know, why reinvent the wheel? So I always just give him him props and I use his structure for dream sharing, community dream sharing. Like one of those pieces is that we always say, if it were my dream. When I, when, like, if I was to re-enter your dream and say, oh, well, I saw this thing, if it were my dream, I would look at it this way. Or, you know, in my dream of your dream, I experienced this, right? So it keeps it from being like you're telling somebody because ev- everybody's dreams are very individual. So he gifted me that. He also gifted me a structure and the tools I needed to do soul recovery work. This dreaming is an entry point for so many things for soul recovery work for time travel, you know, shadow healing work, for communicating with the departed, for manifesting. And with the soul recovery, it has been so effective for me. If someone like says, I stopped dreaming, my question for them would be, what was your last dream? Because everybody's had at least one, right? And so maybe they would say, when I was eight years old, I had a dream, a reoccurring dream that I was drowning. And that was the last time I remember dreams. And so that that would be the starting point for both the dreaming and the soul recovery. Because when someone stops dreaming, often it is an indication that it was one, you weren't getting the message from your dream. You weren't hearing them. And it was too much for your subconscious to process. And so, you know, you went on with your life, but a little piece of your, some people call it soul. I would also refer to it just as your creativity. Your authentic self got is back there, you know, in this illusion of time. And you're, you did it to protect yourself. And I can go into like, that is a rabbit hole. You know, I have, I've worked with people who, you know, were molested, at, you know, by priests. You know, I'm talking like really the deepest, darkest closet you can have. And there's pieces out there of yourself. So what we would do is we would take that original dream and we would both re-enter it. And a lot of times from an energetic place, like I, I could see things as I reenter, just like a dream, you know, where the soul is hung up or where there is like energies that are feeding because that happens when you have soul loss, it creates a, a space within your, your aura or your energetic field that is weaker. And it literally, you can attract Klingons, as I like to call them, right? That feed on you and keep you, you know, and it, it, how it manifests is that little voice in your head. You can't do that. You'll never do that. You know, you're not good enough. That's the, a pulsating thing a lot of times on you that you can't see that's eating your energy. And so that was my training with Robert was in how to help people in that way. 
Um, and sometimes you have to do it more than once. You have to keep doing it and keep setting because, you know, there's a lot. We sow things to it. If this is a time loop and we're running through it, if you have some soul loss back there, you can seed, you basically build a structure around your weakness. Does that make sense? All of that can be addressed within the dream work. And I love helping people in this way because it has been so profound for me. That's so deep. Honestly, you're speaking my language. I was going to ask, when you say the re-entry, do you do that in your sleep or is it just through conversation, talking to people and like going back into that dream, like with a conversation? It's a little bit of both. It, we call it conscious dreaming because we're fully conscious, right? And the monthly dream group, we actually do it on Zoom. And I just, that's been one of the blessings of the um, whole pandemic was the way that Zoom has come about like this. But basically, it's an active imagination practice. One of the things Robert used to say that I, I really loved is that we should learn to take waking life more literally and dreams more seriously, more you know, concrete, because this is a dream too. And I really feel, you know, feel that way about it. So what we do in the, in the dream groups is we use shamanic drumming. We use just like a real steady heartbeat drum, which slows down your brain waves to the alpha state. From there, we use creative visualization. So like, if I say to you, I'm in a white room, sitting on a red couch with a black cat, you see those, you know, you get an image, right? And so if that was my dream and we all four or five people would say, okay, that's the entry point. That's what we're going in to do. You may, when you enter the dream, see that like there was somebody standing behind me and there was um, another cat in the corner of the room. And when we come back and we share and you, and you say, you know, in my dream of your dream, there was an old woman standing behind you. You know, oftentimes I've seen it happen where it's like, oh, I forgot to tell you that. But you saw it, you know, which again confirms that these dreams are real places in the ethers, you know, because as you re-entered, like nothing is chance. So that dream has something for you, as well as like your version is then giving me more information. It's so fun. Everybody has like their own dream language, you know, and like you were saying, it's like a real place, even if it's not physical. And so having other people to like be there with you, you get different perspectives like, oh, maybe I didn't notice this or maybe I didn't think of it that way. And even if whatever other perspectives don't really resonate, it'll help you come to clarity because only you understand your own dream language. So I always tell people like, you know, don't just Google what does a cat dream mean, you know, like really analyze and dive into it and really figure out like what your dreams trying to tell tell you like it's always giving us messages and tips and like you were saying like little um previews of our life and we can take that information and like really use it to our benefit it's so good you know the techniques or i shouldn't call it a technique but one of the paths that i've studied is egyptian dreaming and in the school of egyptian dreaming they really believe that this is the most important thing and you better get it together and you better get good at it because when you die you are given one chance to, you know, to navigate the Bardos. And if you are already skilled at becoming lucid and at calling on your guides, because you need those guides to get through, you know, those are the, those are the skills you need for the afterlife, basically. So at last night I incubated in the hive where, you know, we do our collective dreaming. We will have a group incubation seed, as we call it, dream seed that we work with in the month. So it might be something like, you know, dream guides, please bring me a dream. I can remember about what's what's blocking me or like last night I said dream guides please bring me a dream to remember about what to share with Amina on the podcast <laughs> and I I just had a dream I had a dream about one of my best friends who lives in Ohio um, and we've done a lot of dream work together and he's one of the few people that I've actually had dream bridges where we're in the same place and can describe it later, you know? And anyway, it was just a short little dream, but I thought, well, that must be what I need to talk about is like shared dreams. That's just going towards like proof that if we're both having the same dream or similar dreams, especially if two people are lucid, you know, we couldn't have made that up. Like we're really sharing a common space. And the fact that a lot of people, like you said, have these experiences, you mm -hmm. know, it's not just crazy talk. It's, it's something really cool that people should start to take more seriously. And people are like, we're all awakening. We're all like realizing mm -hmm. these things. This is it's yeah. supposed to be fun. We're supposed to be having a good time, both waking and asleep, I feel like. 
Yeah. And it's not supposed to be easy. You know, like you, I think we signed up for this knowing that it was going to be ups and downs. But for me, the, my dream space is just so important because it, like you said, it can prepare you for things like even the next day. Like if you have something coming up and you're anxious and you need ideas or inspiration, like you can incubate that. You can decide what you want to dream about. And it takes practice. You know, it takes a lot of practice and just finding what works for you. But um, the incubation, like you were saying earlier, our minds are just really powerful. And, you know, we can get whatever result we put into it, you know? Yeah. So those seeds, that is probably that right there, a dream journal and being able to incubate or plant seeds is that's the basis for anybody who wants to start. That's where to start. Agreed. And I tell people that all the time, the dream journal at the very least, because, you know, even though it's a practice and everyone has their own different ways, like my dream journal, I love it. Like I'm going on a couple of years now since I've been consistently doing it. And yeah, like I notice things I wouldn't otherwise have seen. I notice patterns. It helps me get more lucid. It's like the benefits of just the dream journal alone are just awesome. Like I'm Mm -hmm. like, oh, that happened. And like in July, I had a dream about my friend having a baby and now she's pregnant like the same way it happened in my dream I found out in real life I'm like wow and I I've had that happen like half a dozen times yes all the time so all the time I love it I've had two of my besties that I dreamed they were pregnant and then I'd be like I had this dream you're pregnant and they're like well only gonna tell anyone yeah (laughs) it's like oh well (laughs) yeah the dreams they, they tell us things You know, in our 3D, in our physical world, we're living at this linear time. We're kind of stuck in it. But when we dream, we like break free from that. And like you said earlier, like we can really see things from a different perspective Mm -hmm. and kind of use that to just move forward because life's not easy. We need as much help as we can get. The Egyptians were right. Yeah. I mean, it's supposed to be hard. And this is one of those gifts that helps us get through it. You know, if it wasn't hard, we wouldn't have this exponential soul growth that we're having. These times, it's many cultures have prophecies about these times. I'm not a big Bible quoter, but there is a quote from the Bible that I often like to refer to in this work about these times where the, the handmaidens will see visions and the old men will dream dreams. And that's the times we're in, you know, and I'm really finding, you know, all kinds of different people. Oh, so I wanted to tell you about a little bit about that. So, okay. So when I started working with Robert, I was 23 and I started going to Antioch college in Ohio when I was 25. And at this, that point, after two years of working with Robert, I was really into it. I just, I didn't care about anything else. All I wanted to do was sleep. And I was having like hundreds of dreams a night. I would write dreams on top of dreams sideways in the journal. Like it just was off the hook. Ah, well, yeah. And once you turn it on, you know, it's on and, you know. Yeah, it's like working out. It gets better and better the more you put your intention into it. Mm -hmm, The more you practice, for sure. I went to a really unique college. It's, it's, was, it's called Antioch. It's different now. I think I was like right on the tail end of some big generational changes. And literally, I was the last person to stay in my dorm room before they burned it down. You know, it was really weird, the closing, but it was a design your own major at the time. And so I have a a bachelor's degree in communications, but my focus was on dream work and photography. And I combined the two in just such a smooth way that was just so fun. And I I ran dream groups at the college for about eight months. And it was every Tuesday. I ended up having a lot of male science majors. I don't know why, you know, but that's what who would come and it would they would come also just to like, I think to turn off because, you know, the science is so deep in the other side of the brain. And so it could come to the dreaming and, and sort of flip it over. And a lot of times, you know, definitely a number of times people didn't have dreams. And so from there, we began experimenting with remote viewing, astral projection, and because it's all just another step. You know, you just tweak it slightly different and you're then remote viewing and we would remote view as a group. So we started doing, let's, let's say in an envelope over here, there's something, let's go and find this something. How many of you can identify what's in the envelope? And it, I mean, it was just so fun and working so well. And so that's, that's how I got started with it, with dream teaching. I mean, I, I mean, I used it in my like senior thesis it was part of this like ongoing, you would walk into this house that was an art gallery of pictures of people's precognitive dreams. Like one of them was called the nosebleed. 
and we did this whole series of photographs. They were actually kind of sexy photographs, but um, it was like blood, you know, and it was like sexy and yet gross at the same time because it was precognitive dream. This person woke up and she had a bloody nose, you know. And so as you walk through the house, there's like these photos and the dreams and mirrors on the ceiling, on the floor and on the walls and a loop tape of the drumming playing as you walked through these like other people's precognitive dreams. It was so fun. And so from there, when I moved to Texas, I kept doing the dream groups. And basically how I did it was I, um, I had a friend who had a teepee to let me use her teepee for the dreaming. And I just went around San Marcos, Texas and hung up in Austin and hung up flyers everywhere. Here's this dream monthly dream group. Oh, you know, no experience necessary. Um, it's a sober event. I found that that was very necessary because people would show up in all kinds of inebriations otherwise. Um, and I would get just because I was, you know, everybody dreams. So I had like molecular scientists and a prison guy who used to de-arm nuclear power plants. I mean, I just got the strangest people and it was awesome. I just loved it. And that's actually how I met my, my husband. I found his card in a, a wine bar that he says he had never been in that said Dreaming Jaguar. Um, on the back, it said, a mind that's all logic is like a knife that's all blade. It cuts the hand that wields it, right? And I was like, ooh. So, and yeah, he, he came to my TV and we, that was 10 years ago and we've pay, pretty much been inseparable ever since. And it's another, it's so funny the way the universe works, right? When you're doing your thing, yeah. when you're in alignment with who you truly are, that's when the universe can bless you. So I think I lived in Texas for 10 years and then, and then we moved here. And um, when I moved here, I discovered that Robert was teaching dream teacher trainings, Robert Moss, um, here in Washington. And I literally hadn't worked with him in a very, very long time, even though I really wanted to see him because I had like questions and things that have evolved of me teaching for a decade, you know. So I went to his advanced ambassador dream teacher training, and it really just started me on the path of teaching again here and then a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, built the Elevation Hive, which is an online forum for, for dreamers and empaths. And um, we, I've been teaching the monthly dream group there for the last couple of years. It's really fun. I think the next one is not this Sunday, but the Sunday after. It's cool. And we just changed the time to make it a little later because we have a lot of mm -hmm. East Coasters, too, who come. And it's like, OK, we got to make it fit for everybody. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, the, the finding your dream community just really helps get motivated and really just figuring out what your dreams are trying to tell you. So I definitely need to do more stuff like that. Well, that that dream seed for anybody who wants to get started, that is is the way to make your dreams useful. You're going to dream every night anyway, so they might as well be working for you. True. One of the practices we do is that, you know, if, say you, you said, dear dream guides, please bring me a dream about this creative project I'm working on. And you had something totally doesn't seem like it was even about it. You dreamed about your ex getting back together with your ex. It was a terrible dream. You wake up like, what does this mean? <laughs> you know, and most people, a lot of people with the temptation is to be like, oh, it didn't match, you know, and move on. But it did. And that's the, that's the piece that we always try to stress. It's like, you got to work with whatever it gives you because 90% of the time spirit and your highest self is going to show you where your blocks are. And so if you're dreaming about your ex, maybe something happened with your ex that caused you to lose self-confidence in yourself. And that little bit of self-confidence is holding you back from the, you know, if you dig at it and you work at it, you're going to find that your incubation is always present symbolic in some way something might be representing something for you and a lot of people will say oh well this one wasn't important I'm not even going to write that down and like you don't want to build that resistance against it you know a lot of people kind of fight what they're getting instead of just embracing it and being like okay what are you trying to tell me dream you know and then like you said they'll find that they actually did get some answers maybe just not the answer they thought they were going to get for mm -hmm. the dream they thought so that's really a good point that I think a lot of people get frustrated there yeah, and they give up and then they'll they'll close down completely sometimes. Yeah, and then it gets And worse. it could be like and if if you haven't had a dream in 10 years and I said when was the last time you dreamed and you said oh I had this terrible dream about my ex. Well, the dreams will stop if you don't get the message. So I would just really encourage people not to give up and to just keep using that seed. Maybe do the same if you don't feel like that was the answer, do the same seed the next night. 
Um, yes. Chances are you're going to dream about your ex again. That's true. Yeah. It's definitely not a one night thing. Like it's a practice, you know, like going to the gym, you got to, to see results. You got to be consistent. It can yeah. take some time for sure. That's why it's the practice, you know? Yeah. Another piece I was going to share about the lucid part is that I studied with Don Miguel Ruiz and Heather Ashamara of the Toltec um, Eagle Clan lineage for a lot of years. And they they have very different dreaming practices than this, than what I'm talking about here. Similar and different. Um, but one of the things the Toltecs are really into um, lucid dreaming for manifesting and creating in your life and also dreaming together. Oftentimes we would do practices where instead of an incubation, it would be a place like one of my teachers went ahead to the great pyramids and planted roses. And then all of us were supposed to go find what he planted, you know, and most of the group came back with the right thing. Right. Why I wanted to mention it was that some of those folks that I worked with never have regular dreams anymore. They have accomplished lucidity to the point where every night they basically wake up inside their dream and a blank slate. What do you want to do? who lucid dream so much that they no longer have spontaneous dreams. And I, I've actually heard them say that that's not a good thing necessarily. Or like, wait, I miss my spontaneous dreams, you know? And so I, I was mostly going to put that out there as a question to you, if you've experienced people who have said that or. We'll be right back. Are you interested in yoga, meditation, and reading spiritual self-help books? Do you admire spiritual teachers such as Oprah, Gabrielle Bernstein, or Eckhart Tolle? Now let me ask you, do you find yourself contemplating life's biggest, most mysterious questions? (laughs) Me too. Which is why I started the Cultivating Spiritual Curiosity Podcast. On this show, I talk with spiritual leaders about everything. Yoga, mental health, therapy, intuition, spirit guides, law of attraction, mediumship, and so much more. Click the links below to join our eye-opening conversations. I have, yeah. I mean, it's funny because a lot of people will be like, oh, but that's such a blessing to have so many lucid dreams, but it can be exhausting, you know, um, mm-hmm. it can to really have your consciousness in there all the time. Sometimes maybe you want to rest or have a certain just see where the dream takes you, you know, so I could see how it could be exhausting. I haven't gotten to that point where I'm tired of my frequent, you know, lucid dreams which I'm not that frequent. It really depends like, you know, how much effort I'm putting into it. Like with anything, you know, the more consistent I am, the more results I have. But um, I have heard that and it can get to that point. But for the most part, I feel like people are trying to get to that point. So I know you've seen the movie Waking Life, which is like every lucid dreamer's rite of passage. So I was obsessed with Waking Life, right? Like I seriously watched it a million times. Me too. I've watched it so many times. (laughs) So I find myself in Austin, but then I start realizing that Waking Life was filmed in Austin. And so here I was, and like, I would go to these parties, and I've met every single member of the cast at this point at random parties in Austin. You know, like, talk about the overlap of, like, dreaming and reality, and like, we're all, I'd watched it so many times, and now I'm in Austin, and I'm, you know, I always thought that was such a trip, though. It's like, wow. Life is crazy, isn't it? It's like it really is. It is a dream. Yeah, totally. And for a little while, we have this particular avatar. Learn to take care of it the best we can. And exactly, yeah. And notice the patterns. Like waking life has so many patterns. Like, like you were saying, just things that we notice that we loop over and over these cycles, and we learn and we grow every time. Well, you know, it's the only thing that really has kept me going in this life is the mystery. And, you know, the more you reach out to it, it reaches back to you. What's like your why for lucid dreaming? Like what keeps you or dream work, I should say, because it's more than just the lucid dreams. But what keeps you so passionate about it and keeps you going with it? I love the way it helps people. I love the way that this is some kind of dormant tool that so many of us have set aside. I'm really passionate about the fact that our culture has, you know, in a hundred different systemic ways, completely made dreaming irrelevant. 
But if you want it, you have to go after it. You know, you have to, that's like going in the rabbit hole and following the breadcrumbs. There are teachers out there and there are pathways that will really empower you through the dreaming, but they're not going to fall at your feet in this culture, you know, except for people like you and I who are out there talking about it nonstop. And most people are like, this chick is crazy. I'm just going to wait for her, <laughs> maybe, or maybe not. And then other people are just drawn to you like flies, you know, like I got to get this nectar. I really think this is the time, you know, as we've moved into the pandemic, you know, all, all of these things that are happening. I just want people to learn to use it because it's yours. You have a, it's your birthright to be empowered by your dreaming. And if it's out there, you can dream it. You could incubate every night. I need to know a way to create power from a water molecule. And if you ask that enough times, you're going to have a dream about how to do it. You know, like if it's out there, you can do it. That's what I would say is what keeps me going is the limitless potential of every person to own their lives, to create their, to live their best lives in this life, to break free from the pain, the circumstances that have created people feeling trapped. You're not trapped. You are, you could go, you can try and travel. One, one of my favorite practices in the healing with the soul recovery is if you had something really, really intense happen to you. And, you know, as a child, you can go back in not only to invite that piece of soul back to you, but you can redream it. You know, if you're, mind plays a story over and over again about how terrible your divorce was or something. It's just an example. Go back in and we'll redream it. The actual thing that happened, but you put your new narrative on top of it, you know, as if it were a dream. What if you ask people different questions? What if you change the outcome? Like, how would that make you feel on an internal level? And it's very empowering for people. Dreams give us the tools we need to heal everything that's happened collectively, ancestrally. That's another big one. Gosh, I could talk about, I could talk, go on and on about this part of it too. Like the ancestral part, because I'm such a strong dreamer with my ancestors that have passed. Um, some people might say, oh, my ancestors were terrible. You know, they were like slave owning monsters. Well, somewhere in your line, you had an awakened person somewhere in that family tree. And so you, that's another thing that we will do is specifically in your seed. Dream guides, please collect, connect me to my most fully conscious and aware and awake ancestor to be a guide. And, you know, from I had to do this so I can talk about that. And it ended up being my my step grandmother, who I'm not even related to in blood, um, but she knew all of the elements. She knew all of the crazies who were, you know, abusive. They got their own Bardo to deal with, you know, but everybody has somebody in their line that can empower them. And through this work, I've really discovered that it just doesn't end when you die. When you are in an earth path, you have obligations to the people who are still alive. You need them to be successful. They can give you pointers. They can help open doors, but you have to ask. Yeah. I mean, so much of this gets me really passionate. It really does. I feel like it's the medicine of these times that we really need. It's mm -hmm. good to know that there's more when we die. We're not alone. Like, you know, we have all of our family and our ancestors and our guides and, you know, our soul family. They want to help us and they need us to help them, too. Like they're doing work on that side. We're doing work down here. So, yeah, like you said, we've got to be intentional. We got to ask for help. And that's how we get results. So, it's a gift. It's not a bad thing. It's, it's even the bad dreams have positive things to teach us. So mm -hmm. I'm glad that that's changing. I'm going to send you a cool, there's a link on my website, on my blog, that I'm just writing this endless list of like possibilities to do in a lucid dream. You know, there's so many possibilities. It's not just let me fly or let me talk to my grandmother, like whatever you need, there's a dream work practice for it i love that part where super profundo on the eve of your day <laughs> section and then waking life where he's like you know you can do anything you can have sex with anyone you want that's the one that gets people like oh really now <laughs> let me let me see what they're talking about 360 vision yeah exactly. um, breathing underwater that was one i i worked on for a while love the cool. breathing underwater in lucid dreams, I've been like, I'm stuck in a traffic jam and this like sucks, you know, what am I doing? I'll be like, see my hands on the steering wheel. Oh, just, I'm just whoop, 
on out of there. I'm like, I'm so out of this factory. Dude, I've done that too. I love that moment of like, wait a second, I don't have to do this. Let me just, yeah, I'm out. Yeah, it's it's really it great. Well, Jamie, like I am so thankful for you and for you coming on here. And we'll definitely do this again sometime because there's so much to unpack. Like, I feel like we just summarized it barely. There's so much that's so deep. Yeah, yeah. We'll definitely come to our the elevationhive.com dream group. And the only other thing I, I really wanted to tell you is that so my friend Amanda, who started the hive and that I teach the classes with a lot. Um, we're going to be teaching an introductory to these tools coming up in the next couple of months. We, we usually do it twice a year and it'll be like over like four weeks. Um, so four classes to go, kind of go learn some of these tools. And she also teaches a class that I think you would be into um, that's called Be Your Own Guide to the Divine. And she basically uses the dreaming, conscious dreaming, to go in and get inspiration for making art. And Amanda is just an amazing artist. Like her huge, giant paintings of like, you know, beautiful white buffalo and, and owls. And, but, and they all come to her through dreams. And so in this class, we use the tool, we'll like collectively have a bunch of people and go into the space to get inspiration. And then using that, you know, because groups are potent, the power of the group to then spend the next two hours creating. Yeah, groups are very powerful and we always have so much to teach each other, especially when it comes to dream work. So if you like this episode, you should definitely check out Jamie's Dream Circles every month. And you can also find the Dream World podcast on Clubhouse where we talk to dreamers and answer questions about lucid dreaming and also just analyze each other's dreams together every Tuesday on Clubhouse. So check out the links in the show notes. We also added a description of all the book recommendations and movie recommendations mentioned in this episode. Thanks for listening to the Dream World podcast. Sweet dreams. I love you guys.